name's Rachel and today I'm here to talk to you about The Book of Azrael by Amber V. Nicole. This is an adult urban fantasy, high fantasy mashup book. I did not like this book. If you have heard me yell about Crescent City by Sarah J. Mass, my complaints about this are shockingly similar, except this has several very mm, frustrating craft problems that even Crescent City does not have. This is a very overwritten, as in depending on what edition you have, this could be 500 or more pages, adult urban fantasy meets high fantasy, much like Crescent City. There are more and more of these like sexy urban fantasy high fantasy mashup books coming along now and I want to like one. And this is another example of one that I do not click with. Book of Azrael is allegedly an enemies to lovers book between a god and a monster. Its tagline is world ender meets ender of worlds. However, that's where we start to see the craft issue coming in like all, right off the bat because those two things mean the same thing. I kept waiting for the book to make it so that somehow those were different things, but they were the same thing. If I call my kid a chicken nugget eater, it is the same thing as me calling my kid eater of chicken nuggets. If I call myself a glasses wearer, that is the same thing as saying wearer of glasses. If I call a book glasses wearer meets wearer of glasses, I am simply calling a book, this is a book where two people wearing glasses meet each other. They're the same thing. My glasses, which I'm obsessed with, are from glassesusa.com. If you don't know, glassesusa.com is one of the biggest eyewear retailers in the US offering thousands of eyeglasses and sunglasses in brands such as Ray-Ban, Gucci, Oakley, and many more. And they also offer contact lenses. I also got prescription sunglasses from glassesusa.com, so I don't have have to like double up. These are my prescription, which is great because I can't see far away stuff. Is that called being nearsighted? So I'm able to drive with these and these are my favorite sunglasses that I've ever had. I also have these prescription lenses that are the same shape. I like getting different shapes of frames because sometimes I want to appear like studious librarian or regular regular millennial hipster. The best thing about glassesusa.com is that glasses start at only $39. That's up to 70% off of retail prices. Glassesusa.com has recently launched a gorgeous collection handpicked and curated by the amazing actress Marseille Martin, inspired by her advocacy for positive representation and breaking barriers. And you can check this collection out exclusively on glassesusa.com's website by clicking the links in my description. And if you love any of these frames, there is a wildly exclusive offer waiting for my followers. And if you are a contact lenses girly, good news, glassesusa.com is the perfect place to stock up on and save on your contact lenses. You get 25% off all contact lenses, Vista, AccuView, by Affinity, Delis, and many more. They're available with any prescription for all users. Shopping online can be fun, but I like glassesusa.com because shopping online for glasses is a little tough, but glassesusa.com makes it really easy with their AR virtual try-on. I've used it to pick out all of my frames and it's been super helpful in helping me decide because you can actually see what the glasses are going to look like on you before you buy them. Shopping at glassesusa.com is a risk-free shopping experience with free shipping and returns and a 100% money back guarantee within 14 days. Again, they are offering a wildly exclusive discount for my followers on top of any current coupon they have already on the website, but it's only available for 24 hours. So click the link in my description box to get all the details. And thank you so much to glassesusa.com for sponsoring today's video. So let me tell you about the World Ender Meets Ender of Worlds book, The Book of Azrael. The official synopsis reads, World Ender Meets Ender of Worlds. A thousand years ago, Diana gave up her life in the deserts of Arioa to save her dying sister. She called upon anybody who would listen, not expecting a monster far worse than any nightmare to answer. Now she does what Caden asks, even if that means securing an ancient relic from the very creatures that hunt her. A king thought long dead and long forgotten. In the old world, his name was Sam Kaya. In the new world, it is Liam. But one title remains true throughout time. He is the world ender, a myth to his enemies, a savior and king to those loyal to him. After the gods war, he locked himself away, hiding from the world. He denied his crown and his responsibilities, leaving the very ones who needed him most to deal with the fallout of the death of their homeworld. Now an attack on those he holds dear sends him back to the one realm he never wished to visit again and into the sights of an enemy he thought imprisoned eons ago. Now enemies older than time must put aside their differences and work together in hopes of saving both their world and every realm in between. My biggest issues with the with this book are mostly craft issues, especially with the the issue of this being overwritten is just one of I have not seen an issue of overwriting like this since I read Crescent City books one and two. The first 16 percent of this book doesn't even need to exist. And that's quite a chunk in a 500 page book, depending on which uh, edition you have, because the typo
typesetting on the physical copy is just incredible. Like it, it would it would be far larger if the typesetting was different. And it's a little hard to read in physical copy. Like this is a friend's book. We buddy read it together. I would not be able to read it this way because of my dyslexia. This would make it much more difficult for me. I did tandem read this on ebook and audiobook. I did buy the audiobook. I think by fixing the craft issues on this, I may have been more inclined to like the characters more, but the craft issues made me feel like I was keeping characters at arm's length. I can draw a lot of comparisons between this book and Crescent City, and I acknowledge how hard it is to create a high fantasy urban fantasy mashup where we have like a city setting that is like ours in the here and now. There are cell phones, there are airports with airplanes, there are restaurants and email and internet and guns. It's a lot to juggle while you're also creating a secondary entire universe. But if you're choosing to do that and create your entire new universe, you have to commit to doing that well and you and your beta readers and your editors should work to ensure that you are not using anachronisms that don't make sense when a person in the real world is reading this. So like if we were reading Crescent City and Bryce Quinlan suddenly says, man, I could really go for some German schnitzel. You're going to be like, how the fuck did Germany get in this world? Sure, this is modeled after parts of our world in the urban fantasy aspects, but this is still a completely different high fantasy world that doesn't have what we have. And the book of Azrael does this in literally chapter two with the main character looking at another person and thinking his Italian suit. What, what do you mean Italian suit? Italy doesn't exist in this universe. So what the fuck is an Italian suit doing here? The fact that that made it through multiple drafts and assumedly editors is really disappointing. Another issue with the writing that I wanna get out of the way before we get into the plot aspects is the use of made up language that is assumedly Spanish adjacent. There's a lot of like vaguely maybe Hispanic sounding. Our main character is, is Diana Ramirez. Her main her sister is Gabriela Ramirez. There's a character named Santiago who's a vampire. A library in one part gets called Bibliotosea which is close to biblioteca, the word in, Sp in Spanish and Portuguese and Italian for library. And these languages have connections. So French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and Roma Romanian are the five romance languages. There's other examples like, like cities being called El Donuma. So obviously the author wanted to go this route of a lot of stuff here being like vaguely maybe Hispanic, but not the real life thing because Spain does not exist in this world. I am not sure of the author's ethnicity just FYI but I feel like a Spanish speaking person probably would not have done all of this. A friend of mine read this and saw the word madre in it which again is mother in Spanish Italian. That word is no longer in the ebook meaning the ebook was changed. What is or at least was there still as I was tandem reading between the audio and the ebook is our main character one of our two main characters Sam Kyle also known as Liam talking to his mother and the word used for mother is like madre, similar to how we had biblioteca turned into bibliotesia, so it's changed a little bit. The problem is that the word used instead of madre now is merda, and I know that everybody who watches me in Brazil just cackled. Merda is almost the Spanish word for shit, which is mierda. It's almost the word in French for shit, which is merde, but it is 100% the word for shit in Portuguese and Italian. Straight up, merda means shit. I brought this up on TikTok and a lot of people who speak those languages were like, come on, what the fuck? <laughs> Like if I'm Brazilian and I pay a lot of reais for this book, I'm gonna be really disappointed when the main character is saying like, hey shit, can I ask you a question to his mother? Because the author didn't do due diligence in the creation process of a secondary language. Well, someone must have told the author this because within 36 hours of me posting this, uh, I, the ebook was changed. Unfortunately, as I said, I'm, I'm tandem reading, the audiobook is still saying merda. So it's not like you can easily, you can go in and change your ebook, you can't go in and change the physical copies. You're gonna have to re upload an entire new audiobook. And the physical copies that are out there, some of these are special editions that people paid a lot of money for. I bought the audio for this and it was expensive. This could have all been avoided entirely, having it, we wouldn't have had to change the ebook, assumedly twice now to take the aforementioned.
mentioned Madre out, and now all the Merda's out, take all the shit out, oh my god. This all could have been avoided by simply hiring beta readers before publishing. So I say all this to encourage other writers, please get many objective eyes on your work before you publish, and if you're gonna go with writing a fantasy version of something like Spanish, please especially make sure that you're doing your due diligence to cross-reference with the other romance languages if you're not like a native speaker so that you're being fair to those who are in your Brazilian and Portuguese and Italian audiences who are paying hefty sums for your book. One US dollar is for her eyes, so they're paying more than us and they also deserve quality books that don't make them feel like their language is an afterthought. You're also running the risk of like really um, disrupting like the immersive piece of building a fantasy world by taking a lot of readers out of it. Here is my best friend who is Brazilian reacting to me telling her that in the book the main character is calling his mom Merda. Hey shit, affectionate. Last thing I want to say before I get into the plot aspects of this is that reviews are for readers. I was commissioned to read this, I did not seek it out. I am simply giving an honest review, so I don't want any more comments from burner accounts asking me how can I be so mean to somebody by pointing out craft issues in a book. I am just reviewing the content of a book for other readers. I don't know this author, I block the author preemptively, as I often do, I don't want to show up in anybody's feed and get anybody's feelings hurt. This review is for readers, it's not for the author, it's not for friends of the author, and if if you cannot separate a person's art from their person, I would encourage you to not watch. I am going to give my honest thoughts so that others can use them to inform their own purchasing decisions whether they choose to not buy it or whether they choose to buy it because often when I one star review a book, other people decide, hey that sounds exactly like what I would want to read and they go buy it. Honest reviews are important for other readers. They aren't for the author, they aren't for the author's friends. Okay? Okay, let's get into it. This, bo uh, this book starts out with a, a not really a disclaimer but something that says this book explores some potentially triggering things. A list of content warnings can be found on the Rosenstar website. Rosenstar is the publisher of the book. It's an indie publisher. This isn't exactly a gripe. It's a strong suggestion. I know that this has become sort of like an industry <sighs> thing that we're doing now where it says this book has some content you might find triggering and you're like okay what is it and they're like well to find out you must go to the website. I really wish more books would just stay up front what the trigger warnings are, what potentially triggering content will be in the book right up front rather than suggesting to go to a secondary website. I think giving your readers up front that info is important. Um, so I'm going to give you the list of triggers from the from the website. Trigger warning for fantasy violence. We can just put violence, I don't, we don't really need to put fantasy in front of that. Gore, emotional and physical abuse, sexually explicit scenes, death of a loved one, grief, PTSD, eating disorder, depression, slut shaming. The eating disorder, I didn't catch any um, bulimia or anorexia in here exactly. It seems to be more like they don't eat for a while because of stress and if I missed anything else that um, that's that's the eating disorder present here, not so much. So if you find like bulimia or anorexia uh, triggering, this is, is probably not going to be triggering in those capacities. Chapter one, we get a POV from Diana. This is dual POV and the first, again, like 17% of this is completely unnecessary. Chapter one is Diana. How this opens is very much like that scene at the beginning of the first Avengers movie. We need you to come in. Are you kidding? I'm working. And that's what did a disservice here. We are in some random place interrogating some guy named Peter. And Diana, our main character, is there with one of her comrades who all work for this guy named Caden. And Diana is an igmorathin, which I lovingly called iguana while testing, uh, texting friends about this book because autocorrect would not stop chastising me for trying to write the word igmorathin. So Diana and her iguana pal Alistair are interrogating a celestial named Peter. And and in this universe there are all kinds of beings. This is again one of like the urban fantasies that has all those different kind of, uh, we're in a city with like interconnected groups of fantasy races. So there's vampires and there's werewolves and there's ignorathans and there's gods and there's celestials. So we're getting this info dump by way of an interrogation scene. Again very like the Avengers one. And this worked in the Avengers because we had a shit ton, ton of other movies to sort of have context for what's going on in the scene with Black Widow. Here it's unnecessary and adds to the problem of 
this being overwritten. My friend Kat, who I was buddy reading this with, said, and I fully agree, that we should have started this book off um, like Percy Jackson with a major inciting incident, like in the museum. I'll come back to what I think the inciting incident should have been, but we are a long way off from that. So we're interrogating Peter and Diana is, you know, like using this, um, well, the author is using this Diana interrogating Peter the Celestial to info dump. How did that go again? Oh, right. Thousands of years ago, your world crashed, burned, and fell into our world, disrupting lives and technology. Now you and your kind pretty much make the rules, right? Now the world knows about gods and monsters, and you are the great do-gooders who keep all the bad guys under lock and key. Now we get shown that Diana has powers. Um, she can wield fire. Her eyes turn like blood slash fire red. Uh, she can see your memories, and she has like super strength because she's an Igmorathan. She used to be a human. Now we don't really see her human life because what happened to her was apparently she was living with her parents and her sister. Her parents died. They ended up, her and her sister ended up in a desert and she, none of this happened on page. Like we get known this like, it, like it gets like brought up in different conversations, but it's never like fully explained what happened. But basically she cried out to anybody who was, who would listen and Caden showed up, made her an Igmorathan and her sister also gets to live a long time. And she only did this because she didn't want her sister to die. So she became a monster to save her sister. And now she works for Caden. And initially it sounds like she's okay with this and that she like hates the Celestials. Says things like, gods, how many Celestials look like college frat boys? This is what we were up against. And then he's shocked about her powers. And she says to him, well, you see, Peter, every Igmorthan has a little quirk. This is just one of mine. And I'm like, wait, they don't know that? The Celestials of another fantasy race, they don't know much about the Igmorthans? There was a war where the Igmorthans were the bad guys. I'm confused. And then again, she says things that make you think initially that she's like cool with being a bad guy. Some warriors these were taking this world for Caden would be a piece of cake. And then it explains that her comrade, it does not call it comrades in the text. I'm sorry. I need to be so clear. I'm, I'm being goofy. It's a silly goofy time over here. Alistair, her buddy, who was also an Igmorathan, uh, it says he had a few celestials under his control, but none with a rank as high as Peter and none that had been this close to that damn city. Caden would be happy for once. So they are doing different things to try to get their boss, Caden, into a higher position of like control. Caden's home realm was long forgotten, sealed after the gods war. Where he came from was much warmer than Onuna and the volcanic island that they inhabit was the closest he could get to the feel of home. Caden had made plenty of Igmorathan since his time here, but they weren't like me, Alistair, or Tobias. They looked more like horned gargoyles, mortals plastered on their buildings. I often wondered if they had seen Igmorathan beasts and copied them in their art, trying to banish their instinctual fear of the monsters. I'm a little confused about what Igmorathans actually are because later it said that Diana and her comrades, Alistair and Tobias, they're all like part of some group and it technically makes her a queen, but then the book just ends and I was very confused. She calls Caden my maker, my lover, and the only reason my sister lived. She was why I did every single thing he asked. So now we're transitioning to, oh, Diana's not bad. She's just doing bad things to save her sister. Oh my God, this is where it gets really silly. So she just des describes seeing somebody and it says, his Italian suit bit tighter than the black dress I wore. His what? Italy does not exist in this world. <laughs> the, I just don't understand how the editor possibly missed that. Then the descriptions start to come in. We're back at home where she lives with Caden and the other Igmorthans, Tobias and Alistair, and then the Igmorthans that are gargoyly, I, I guess. We don't really see them. They, there's a meeting they attend and she says, I was a blade made of fire and flesh. So it just, it's sort of channeling Jennifer L. Armantrout a little bit. Basically, she's trying to say, I'm a weapon. I just feel like, I don't know, there was a better way to say that. So then Caden tells all these different fantasy races at this meeting he's holding, I have word on the book of Azrael. And one of the fantasy races says to him, if it's even real, you know what it brings with it. The world ender, says a soft feminine voice from the left corner. And I'm like, oh, so we're gonna do the masculine feminine thing in this. And we do, constantly. The amount of times that the word masculine sent, masculine voice, masculine this, masculine that, I'm like, ah, stop it. Find a new way to describe things. Find a new way to describe things. Please, masculine is not a, a catch-all for description. You can, you can describe voices a different way, I promise. A feminine scent, a feminine voice. Just stop, I just, every time I read urban fantasy there's just weird like gender is two very different like stop please oh my god find new ways to describe things and stop being so heavy on the gender roles the fabled world ender the legend the son of unir wielder of the blade of oblivion and where is he pay no attention to the fables others have built in his image if he were as strong and skilled as they say where is he i've destroyed thousands of 
his kind, hundreds, sorry, of his kind, and yet he does not show. He is a coward, weak, damaged. This world ender is not a god like others before him. He has no real power, but we do. By the way, this is basically the only scene that Caden's gonna be in until the very end. I was extremely disappointed because I thought, mm, this feels a little, a little like mustache twirl, villain monologue e bad for the sake of being bad, absolutely no nuance. And I'm like, maybe it'll grow. No, he, he pops up again at the end and it's worse. It's actually even more mustache twirly. And the leader of one of the fantasy races, The Shades, asks, and this book, do you have it? And Caden says, that's the next part. I do not have it yet, but soon. But just like paragraphs earlier, he said, I have word on the book of Azrael. He already answered this question. Were you not listening? Or did the, did the author forget? He gets upset with some of the vampires and just like orders her to kill them. So she does. And then she goes on to describe herself. I had become a creature that could rip memories from blood, summon flame in an instant and shift into any beast I wished. Oh yeah, I forgot she shapeshifts too. Just a whole arsenal of powers. I was described as beautiful and exotic. The, world, the words made me inwardly flinched as if I'd been slapped in the face. I knew I was deadly, cruel, and lethal. For her, for us, I had allowed Caden to unleash me. I carved her a place of peace with claws and broken bones. Talking about how she became a monster to protect her sister. And then explaining their relationship between her and Caden says, I had cared for Caden in the beginning until a few hundred years of excusing his behavior had grown old. Now I'm going to go back to the part where I said I think that we could have had a better inciting incident. In this beginning, we are just talking about Diana do bad things because Diana loves sister. We could have had this entire beginning um, basically been gone and done an inciting incident, which I'll get more specific about in a little bit, um, where we introduce Diana as a person trying to, ha who has been for a long time, making a very intricate plan to escape this dude who has been exploiting her and, and also keep her sister safe, like get them both out of this, out of this like fantasy organized crime basically. But instead, um, she's just like, well, I'm gonna do bad things, save my sister for uh, almost 20% of this book. And it's so boring <laughs> and completely unnecessary. And then he asks her to kill one of the vampires, which I don't really understand how Caden wields so much power already. There's so many fantasy races and he's just, how did he, how did he overpower all of them? Why do they agree to this? Why don't they all rise up against him? I have no idea. He was asking me to kill a friend. Drake was one of the very few beings I trusted completely and I knew without a doubt that I had no choice. Now this whole thing with Drake is completely unnecessary. It's used so that she can later have a place to go because guess what? Drake's not actually dead. They fake his death and you find that out later. But him staying alive is basically just sort of like a convenient way to get Diana where she needs to go later. A lot of this book is a wild goose chase to nowhere and Drake is a big example of that. His brother is like the leader of the vampires. It's it's all pretty unnecessary. <laughs> so she goes and she bites her best friend and then they fake his death. We don't know that it's him and her faking his death until way later but at that this point in the book that's what's happening. And they fight before she fake kills him and she scolds him for not attending the meeting. That's why Caden wants him dead um, because he sent other vampires and then she had to kill those other vampires. <laughs> Which all of this again I don't understand this hierarchy whatsoever. So she's like you know what happens now. You knew when you repeatedly sent others to that meeting without Caden to that meeting what Caden would do and how he would react. He was never going to tolerate your disobedience Drake. I don't understand the loyalty here or they at least willing to like deal with Caden. Again couldn't they just all rise up against Caden? I don't understand how Caden is more powerful. They have there's power in numbers like you've got to establish why these other fantasy race races even bow to Caden. And he tells her that he thinks Caden is going to use this book to create a massive war and you, that it's going to bring the world ender on or it's going to bring out the world ender which is Liam slash Sam Kyle our other main character. And she says oh you can't be serious you too he's nothing more than a legend yet you condemned your whole family for it. There these are stories Drake stories to keep us in line. They all died. The old gods are dead. The gods were remember. All that's left are the celestials and the hand. That's it. Now the hand is a group of celestials that is uh that was formed and run by Sam Kyle slash Liam. And I don't really understand like the lack of communication of like I mean Sam Kyle is still alive. He's just up on a planet fucking around feeling sorry for himself because he killed a bunch of people um and ended the world that he inhabited. I don't really understand how they don't know that he still exists. He's still alive when the hand is still somewhat in contact with him. The celestial group that he runs is still on earth and still reports back to him. I don't understand. <laughs> now if there was no communication between the Igmorathans that Drake runs and the hand then sure but there is like they just they just did at the first scene with Peter. I don't really get this. Diana I don't want to fight you. You're just as strong as him if not more so. Stay with me. With us we can help and protect each other. Okay so if he does feel this way then why haven't everybody else banded together? 
together against Caden. He thinks that just him and Diana can take on Caden? Why don't y'all all band together? I don't understand. So because she did what Caden asked, Caden allows her to go visit her sister. It's been months since she's allowed to see her sister. Now her sister is also very, very old. They are like a thousand years old. And when she shows up, her sister is boning a dude. And she's like, well, I'm thinking about letting him move in with me. They, they have this conversation where, where it's almost as if this person who has been alive a thousand years and they're having a conversation about this relationship, like how can it last? Well, I don't want to be alone. As if this is the first time they're ever, this is the first time you're ever having this conversation in a thousand years. You guys have never had this conversation before. Now I would have let it go if Diana had said in the text, Gabby, we've had this conversation before. You're immortal. The people you date aren't. But no, somehow in a thousand years, Gabby has never had a long term. What do you mean? Caden had saved her and Gabby's life, her, her Diana and Gabby's life. So she, it said that she was so close to death, Gabby, that the parts that made us ended up weaker in her. She would live longer, but she couldn't change any, into anything she wanted. And she didn't have the urges that um, Igmorathans do. So Diana um, eats humans. She eats people for power. And um, Gabby just lives a long time, which I feel like is really convenient. Caden's, nobody that Caden has changed, uh, allegedly, or, or apparently, like assumedly, nobody that Caden has changed before has just ended up with no power. But somehow Gabby didn't end up a monster. And this just feels really convenient because it's like, okay, now we get this thing where it's like only Diana gets to be the monster so that we can save this long living immortal sister who's perfect. And it just feels like we couldn't think of a better way to do this. Why doesn't Gabby end up an Igmorthan? She just doesn't. She just, everybody else does, but Gabby just doesn't. It doesn't, it just feels a little, a little lazy. Instead, Gabby gets good powers, which Igmorthans apparently never do. She could calm someone, heal them in a way. Her voice soothed, her touch brought comfort, and her presence alone just seemed to make even the most irate patient quiet, quiet down. She's a nurse. Now, it would maybe make more sense if, if somehow like Caden's power made like two at once where he made like this dichotomy, a good power wielding person and a bad power wielding person where one person destroys and one heals and rebuilds um, every time. But the fact that it's just Gabby alone and there's no reason given for this is kind of crappy world building. Then it says this weird thing where they're talking, she's talking about how she kind of wants to marry this doctor that she's been working with. And it says, since the gods war, the rules and customs had changed. Shit, even the technology was different. Marriage wasn't a piece of paper that you got that said you were bound to one another. It was beyond permanent and meant if you were you were one in almost every sense of the world word, when you married, you become true partners, the bond that of soulmates. And I'm like, what? Why? 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 Why that? Why? Not permanent marriage. Oh God. No reason is given for this. It's just everybody, if you get married, you are linked forever. So she's allowed to go basically to visit her sister on like this long-term vacation. And she's basically just waiting the whole time for Caden to call her up and be like, you have to come back now and do bad deeds. They just spend their time lounging around, singing karaoke, jumping from couch to couch, putting their hair up in lopsided ponytails. I'm literally reading this. Faces covered in some weird face mask Gabby had spent way too much money on. Hey, if that is a lush face mask, that is not too much money. It's worth every penny. Your skin will never have been smoother. Diana hates the celestials, like Peter and also um, Sam, Sam Kyle is also a celestial because when they came down to earth, they destroyed a bunch of shit. So Gabby says to her, you really hate them, don't you? I snorted, don't you? They're the reason mom and dad are gone and why our home is practically non-existent. Diana, they didn't kill mom and dad, the plague did. The plague was caused by whatever bacteria they brought down with them. She sighed, that was just a coincidence. There's no proof that that was the cause. Besides, I work with a few celestials, they're nice. So this means that the celestials and humans are interacting, or at least whatever the fuck Gabby is. The celestials and most people are interacting. So I don't really understand why Sam Kyle seems to be a myth. Like celestials know that Sam Kyle still lives. So why Igmorathans are like, he's a myth. I don't get it. Then her and Gabby um, go to a restaurant and it says the warm ocean breeze curled my hair around my chin. And I was like, wait, what the fuck? What did we get by the ocean? Anyways, they reminisce on their parents. I wonder what our life would have been had they not gotten sick. And then she says, we never really talked about my sacrifice, what I gave so she could live. In a thousand years, you've never talked about your sacrifice. A 
thousand years listen i get it i don't talk to my family either but i'm 30 okay by the time i'm 50 i assume that we're gonna open some can of worms but a thousand a thousand years a thousand i don't think so gabby wants diana to leave Caden and company and she's like i can't leave and i don't want to fight with you about it you know this you know you know i hate talking about it so they have talked about the fact that diana can't leave but they've never talked about the di the fact that diana gave up her like goodness to become a monster so that gabby could live they've never why talk about one but not the other they they are inextricably linked. We both died centuries ago in that damn desert. Wh whether you want to admit it to yourself or not, we're different. I'm different. This is the first time in a thousand years they are ever having this conversation and they are having it at a restaurant by the beach. And Gabby's like, why don't you fight back? You have the skills. You're strong. If that's true, why doesn't Diana fight back? Is Diana stupid? She couldn't band together with other people to take on Caden? That's why I think that this book should have been leading with her making an intricate plan and leading a double life so that she could get her and Gabby out of the situation. It says she had kept her feelings behind the same wall kind of wall I'd constructed around my own emotions and I'm like wow there was really a better way to write that sentence and then all of a sudden Al Alistair and Tobias her Igmorthan buddies they show up they are rude to Gabby and she's like don't talk to my sister like that and then they say we're going back to El Donuma which is not a Spanish word it's just Spanish-ish as we've established this book does. We get a lot of extraneous detail that I don't really need explained to me but also so it's kind of like convenience magic where it's like the black jeans and red crisscross tank I wore still looked as clean as when I put them on even though she just changed uh shapeshifted from one being to another a perk of Caden's blood the magic we used to change only altered our outer appearance and I'm like okay yes I guess we did need to establish some way in which it's possible for you to switch appearances but still maintain your clothes but I don't know like this is like <laughs> the time in Throne of Glass in in the third book where she's like where do your clothes go when you switch and uh the the dude with the blonde hair uh the, the boyfriend husband of Aelin says oh they just go somewhere else okay great honestly just make yourself naked at that point so they go to a library uh bibliotesia they're looking for the book of Azrael, and it says if i were an ancient book that could open realms i would probably live there yeah i'm surprised you guys haven't been checking libraries before this to be honest you would think that if it's a book a library is probably the first place you would check but all right there's a guy there and it says he approached steadily the blue tribal design that decorated the exposed skin of his hands tribal design <laughs> what tribe what are you talking about it just feels like leaning on our world for world building but all right it's like italian suit all over again i am a guardian of the other world and the nether world the hand of sam kyle and he says to them you are beasts of legend whose eyes drip as red as the blood they consume now that <laughs> This line is written funny uh, because it almost sounds like the eyes are the, are the ones consuming blood. Like I know that's not what it means. I just feel like that line could have been written in a way that doesn't sound like the eyes are sucking up blood. Only one breed of creature could wield that much strength and harness that much dark power. The Igmorathen. The Iguana. How do you exist? You and your species were extinguished when the Rashirim fell. I'm like, wait, how do y'all not know that Caden exists? What is the dynamic here? And she's like, I could ask you the same question. And I'm like, well, I would like to ask both of you this, that question because I don't understand how both of you have existed without knowing that the other exists. What are the dynamics of this world? Didn't you just say that your sister works with Celestials and Caden is, is in charge of like all of these other fantasy races, but then also sent his men to go attack and like take over the body of one celestial in the be very beginning Peter because Alistair has the ability to like manipulate minds and turn people basically into like his little robots to carry out his will meanwhile Tobias has the power to animate dead bodies which is super cool and the only reason why this book gets one and a half stars instead of one because I fucking love necromancy so they get into a fight she says I heard stories about the hand fabled warriors hand selected by some douchebag god all special in their own way all powerful and yet only a few survived the gods war some warriors and i'm like wait so if the hand exists then couldn't they confirm that sam kyle is still alive why do you think sam kyle's dead you know nothing about us creature none of the hand fell we are still as many as the day sam kyle chose us and once he learns of your existence he will come back come back you're lying all the old gods are dead is that what you believe obviously it is what she believes and i'm not really sure why she finds a um weapon and it says it had no runes or markings it was basic 
basic and yet not. Again, I feel like there's a better way to describe that. The edge was razor sharp, the blade slightly curved at the tip. I had never seen a metal like this. It looked silver and yet a sheen danced across its surface as if it were crafted from stars. Then it says that the guy chuckles, the sound making him seem mortal, if not for his weird glowing tattoos. And I'm like, does this mean? He says, I'm not gonna kill you. I'm gonna have Sam Kael and the Council of Hadramio will place their, or I'm gonna call Sam Kael and the Council of Hadramio will place their final judgment. Caden shows up and they all get into a fight and it says that Caden has something called the Forsaken Blade made from the bones of ancient Igmorathans. That's just fucking cool. I like that. Another thing I liked about this book is that earrings or earrings and rings, definitely rings can turn into weapons. I like that shit. Um, I like when we have stuff like that where jewelry can in turn into a weapon um, and I don't even need it to be explained to me like how this is like magically changing into an entire ass weapon. I just like it. So again, this is another reason why I gave this one and a half instead of one. Shit I like is in here. So it gets a little bit of a pass. Not a lot of a pass, but a little bit. And Caden wants Alistair to make this guy into one of his mindless slaves. This guy's name is Ezekiel, by the way. Not Ezekiel, Ezekiel. And I'm a little confused because if their powers work on him, why didn't she just, cause she can touch somebody and set them on fire and like kill them really quickly. She just allegedly did this to her vampire friend. She did it to a couple of other people. So if their powers work on Ezekiel, I don't really understand why she just didn't kill him. She had her hands on him a couple times. His scream was that of a being in mortal pain and he was shifting from one creature form to the next. And I'm a little confused about this. What is mortal pain? Immortals don't feel pain? Or does that mean like, cause you're on the verge of death? I don't know, sentence is weird. You don't even know who Azrael was. If he made a book and hid it, then it's not meant for your kind of find. It will bring Sam Kyle back. And then he, she says, you mean the Sam Kyle? He was real? I'm like, wait, didn't we just have this conversation? What are you talking about? Isn't he the world ender? And I'm like, he, he talked about Sam Kyle like three paragraphs ago. He said, Sam Kyle and the council of blah, blah, blah will pass judgment. What, why didn't you ask this question then? What is going on here? And so he cries out to Sam Kyle and says, Sam Kyle, grant me passage from here to the Aesteroth. Aesteroth? No, that was the heavenly dimension far beyond space and time. Fuck. And I'm like, wait, is this supposed to be like derivative of like, like Thor and Odin and all that? Is that, is that what this is based on? The light raised to the center of his chest and then exploded in the most vibrant blinding blue beam. <sighs> blinding blue beam. Good grief. Shooting straight into the sky. I raised my hand to shield my face, blah, blah, blah. So he gets yoinked into a stereo, a stereo, a stereo, a nope. And Caden is mad. <laughs> what did you do? He says. And it says for the first time in centuries, I saw fear in his eyes. So apparently he fears Sam Kyle. So here's where I'm going to stop and say that was chapter seven. Okay. That was the end of chapter seven. We're about to go to chapter eight with Liam. This book should have started with not any of that. This book should have started with her finding a way if, if Sam Kyle is the thing that scares Caden, we should have done this where she goes to the library and manipulates it so that um, she gets Sam Kyle to show up and take on Caden. That they go on this quest to go find this book together. And we could have had like a whole underground labyrinthine like maze shit where it's like her and Sam Kyle versus the Igmorathan sent by Caden, both of them trying to find this book before the other. Sam Kyle wants to destroy it. The Igmorathans and Caden want to use it to destroy the world. We could have done that. It's way less overcomplicated and underdone and overwritten than this is. And we basically get this, this entire chapter of Sam Kyle being up on like the ruins of Rashiram, basically just being like, woe is me. All my people are dead. It's my fault. The war with the Igmorathans. Woe is me. I am so terrible and feeling sorry for myself. He's half God, half, half celestial and like that causes some like inner conflict. He has a lot of daddy issues. His mom died a while ago. And his mom, again, in, in the book, in the audiobook, and then originally in the ebook, he was calling her Merda. So when he says, Merda, can I ask you a question? I just died laughing. I'm sorry, but you just affectionately called your mother shit. I know that like some people are like, well, some languages mean different things. Yes, but if you're gonna do a language, a fantasy language based off one of the romance languages, and the word that you're using for mom is already close to the language that you're trying to emulate, Merda, with an I, and then it's 
also connected by being a romance language to several other languages where it also sounds like the word shit. Like a simple Google search would have amended this. And it did get amended in the ebook, but again, it's too late for the audiobook. Like, let's be serious. People deserve better written books than this. A simple Google search. If you're gonna create your own language based off of an existing language, make sure that you're not calling your mom shit. <laughs> like, I just feel like that's not a lot to ask. So he's like complaining a lot. He used to be like a, a bad boy, like a fret boy, and he, you know, had a lot of sex. Also, he's a bisexual king, which again, point in this book's favor. Diana is also a bisexual queen. Like, I'm happy that that exists. So he was like, I was so, you know, bad, and my dad told me to take my job seriously. It's very like Oren Odin, and now his dad's dead, and he has to be more responsible, and he's like really depressed that everything went to shit, and he accidentally is the reason why everything is gone to shit. He's the world enter, and he's wallowing in self pity instead of getting therapy. And then he hears Sam Kyle grant me passage from here to Aristarioth because Ezekiel down on the planet is, you know, about to be murdered by Ignorthans. The ancient words, the chant meaning only one thing, it meant death. So he heads on down to the planet. And his friends are already there because again, the hand, the group of celestials that he formed that works carrying out his will on Earth, they are on the planet. Not Earth, but the planet. So his friends, Logan and Vincent, are there and he's like, well, I heard Sam, I heard Ezekiel like call out for me and they were like, well, we sent word to Imogen and he's like, oh yeah, she did mention a growing concern. Okay, so the Celestials know that the Igmorthans are doing some fuck shit and they've been talking about it, but the Igmorthans don't know that not only does Sam Kyle exist, but an entire council that reports to him. I don't understand. Anyways, we literally could have started the book here. We could have literally started the book with this inciting incident of Diana goes to the library, turns on Caden, gets Ezekiel to call out for Sam, Sam Kyle and then they meet and then she says, protect me from him and I will help you get this book in exchange for my sister's life. Like we're ha we have to do some tweaking to, you know, get like stakes and, and you know, people's uh, ambitions in, in, in line to make it seamless, but that's already a better plot and we are not at 20% through the fucking book to get there. Like the amount of time we spent with Diana and her sister was exorbitant for no fucking reason. It's there to try to make you care, but because no plot is happening, you don't. And it's trying to make you care because because we're gonna kill Gabby in the end, which we all saw coming, but we didn't make the audience care first. It even says trust had grown between mortals and celestials through the centuries, allowing them to form working relationships. But the celestials on earth that Sam, Sam Kyle uh, reaches out to knows he exists. So I don't understand how the mortals are under the impression that he doesn't exist anymore and how this was news to Diana. He asks his friends, you spoke about sending Ezekiel to one of our Bible Toseas. Why did he not return? Bible Toseas. Anyways, he didn't return because he did. Um, so he has not been on this planet, so he's not familiar with a lot of shit. But this gets forgotten almost immediately. First, he says things like a woman was exiting a building and wore some type of reflectors on her face, sunglasses. But then like, he almost immediately gets used to everything on Earth. Like, we basically never bring this up again. And I'm like, what was the fucking point? Haven't they been reporting to him? How does he just not know anything? They didn't bring him any tech, like what? Why? I don't get it. And so then he's shocked to find out that Igmorthans are alive and on Onuna, the planet. How? It shouldn't be possible. Those that had not died on Rashiram were locked behind the realms, yet three of the beasts stared back at me with three sets of blood red eyes. Three monsters from the other world were on Onuna. I'm like, this is the first time that you, a literal person in charge, are hearing about this? How? And some dude named Henry shows up and is basically just like being annoying and said, I guess I expected more from the one they call World Ender. And then suddenly Henry, Henry changes and it's Diana. And he's like, you, you're the one from the photo. You're the Igmorthan. No shit. And this is where I'm saying we did not need to do any of this. We could have simply had them meet by her being like, I need you to protect me from this dude who changed me. You're the only thing he's afraid of come to find out. Therefore, you're my way out of this. So I'm calling you down from the heavens. You protect me. We get the book back and then we kill this guy. So Sam Kyle, this is your hand. Not very intimidating if you ask me. All you have to do is cut one of their hands off and they're powerless. I felt Vincent shift next to me, but he didn't step forward word, you're the one who killed Ezekiel. So they're mad at her because she killed that guy Ezekiel. And then um, he calls forth his weapon, which is called the ablaze weapon, uh, the silver broadsword sharper than any man-made steel. Now, listen, I like the idea of changing jewelry into weapons. Um, I also even like the idea of like in Percy Jackson, the pen becomes a sword. I love it. I love doing that. Calling something the ablaze weapon sounds super fucking silly to me though. We couldn't have come up with anything else. I think we could have. Okay. So 
I'm gonna jump a little a little forward she gets into it with Logan she's about to kill him she feels bad because he has a wife <laughs> Logan is one of the hand and his wife is also in part in, in the hand she's like I feel bad so we're gonna I'm actually gonna I'm gonna kill my partner so she kills Alistair because she suddenly like feels bad and then she takes Logan back to Sam Kyle and is like listen I'm gonna kill him unless you make a blood pact with me to save my sister cool and so they do and they make a tentative blood pact to um as long as her sister is alive she will work with Sam Kyle again this could have been the whole thing we could have done this from the beginning and saved ourselves like 30 percent of this book so now we're at like 25 30 percent in and they make this blood pact they get Gabby they take her to where the celestials are staying Sam Kyle has magically gotten totally fine with all of these like new technology and even things like sunglasses they're putting Gabby up in a room wherever the fuck they stay and Diana finally goes and talks to her and she says she's looking around the room for wires cameras or listening devices I know they have to have one somewhere and Gabby's like why would they have cameras don't they have super hearing and I'm like yes they do can you answer the question why would they have why would they have cameras they have super hearing I don't understand that that question doesn't get answered please Caden has cameras all over the place and not just for sexy fun times okay but but if they have super hearing then why like I answer the question in chapter 23 Three is where I started realizing that the uh, ebook had changed and the word Merida had been taken out and replaced with Mama, but the audiobook I was tandem reading. So the audiobook is saying Merida in my ears and the ebook is saying Mama, and I'm like, oh, I'm fucking confused. And that's when I realized that the ebook got changed. It's a flashback between him and his dad, and he's saying, Why didn't you resurrect Mama, Merida? Because um, you could have, you have the power to. And it says, Resurrection, no matter the cir circumstances, is forbidden. You do not gain something so precious as a life without paying a hefty price. There are some things that even we cannot afford. At some point Diana gets hurt several times actually and in one of them I do like that she's like brawny and she's like the muscle. He is also the muscle but she is also the muscle. Like I feel like she's more of the muscle than he is. Again a point in this book's favor but it's so overwritten it made me mad so it's still one and a half stars. And she he at one point feeds her his blood and she's like you can't feed me your blood because if you feed me your blood I will see your memories. I will have dreams blood dreams where I will see your memories and this is how we do a lot of like Diana learning about Sam Kyle to understand him but a lot of what happens is just like her watching him have sex so I'm like I didn't actually I don't actually think she needed to know that and the way that he talks to her and it gets like worse and worse throughout the book is like very robotic which is not how he used to talk back in the day but then like because he got depressed he suddenly became like very robotic I don't like it I don't like it I felt very much like we were trying to do like a Thor and whatever the fuck her name is type thing except like more sassy and actually come to think of it this book just feels very Marvel inspired anyways Marvel Cinematic Universe that is I don't like the like roboticness of him it felt very played out I don't mind when an actual android is falling in love and it's like this but here it did not work like I like defy the stars because it's an android actually learning how to be a human but this is a god who was just like any other dude and then had something terrible happen to him and became very robotic in how he deals with things and is very no nonsense and does not swear and then she makes him a little bit of a bad boy again I don't like it so it turns out that because she has now betrayed Caden killed one of her comrades and put her sister up safely so Caden doesn't have any way to try to get to her to get her to do what uh, he wants her to do Caden has now put a price on her head and there is a witch named Santiago who is now after her now they go on basically a road trip all over the fucking place going and talking to like basically like spider people which was pretty fucking cool but they make an appearance and then they go away immediately to get information about things like Santiago they see See different celestials they're they're on a whole ass road trip together meanwhile her sister is back with the hand so his friends are watching her they start very suddenly at like out of nowhere like they argue constantly and then out of nowhere they start to find each other extremely attractive and talk about each other in their inner inner in their heads in ways that I just felt like kind of uncomfortable at times and then other times I just didn't understand like out of nowhere he's like really annoyed that when they go see her friend Drake the vampire who she fake killed and his brother he's really mad that her and Drake are kind of like friendly overly friendly they're sparring together because of course her and Drake are sparring together and says ready to get hot and sweaty cutie I'll stretch you out before he grinned suggestively at her and my blood boiled he could not tell if they were past lovers and I refused to ask it was not my place and I shouldn't care but a part of me had hoped he had never laid a hand on her naked flesh it was a ridiculous notion Diana was not mine and we were only associates friends but if it was the truth or if that was the truth then why did my heart ache Drake 
question. I have no idea. For me, this is coming out of nowhere. And earlier, he, they get there, by the way, I forgot about this super interesting part. They get there and she's like, Drake set me up with everything I needed. He got me a razor. The hair on my legs and vagina was out of control. And I'm like, I cannot believe that you have not established basic world building shit, but I have to hear about the hair on this woman that she needs to take a razor to. This is the wrong information. This is the, the information I need absolute least. It's bottom of the list. I do not care how long her vagina hair is. I do not care. I want to understand the world that we're building. What if she preferred men like Drake, even though I knew I should not care, it shouldn't bother me. It did on some base level. I hated the playful slaps of her small hand on his chest and shoulders. I felt those were reserved for only me, yet she did the same to him. She truly laughed when he spoke or made some crass comment. Bro, she is allowed to have friends. You fucking weirdo. Then Drake gives her some clothes and he decides, I don't like those clothes enough. And he changes her clothes magically. He, he changes her outfit for her. What the fuck is this paternalistic bullshit all of a sudden? I don't understand where this is coming from. This is gross and weird and I don't like it. And then he like refuses to sleep next to her. And up to this point on this long ass unnecessary road trip we've taken to find out information about the book of Azrael, by the way, is what we're doing, which I don't understand. I, I forget the made up nonsense reason why we can't just teleport all over the fucking place. Something about magic, but couldn't they just fight off Caden if he was trailing her magic? How is he? I don't understand, honestly. We had to have an excuse for them to go on a road trip together, essentially. And they've been sleeping next to each other. And then he stops sleeping next to her and she gets upset. And him seeing that she's upsetting spaghetti about this says, I apologize for my actions lately. I am getting tired of waiting and it's frustrating me. And I'm like, yeah, bro, fucking same. I've been sitting here waiting for a fucking plot for I don't know how long. It's been a million hours. So they're talking to Drake and they bring up a witch named Camilla who's supposed to have information on the book of Azrael. So they need to talk to Camilla and he, she explains, okay, well, Camilla and I know each other because she used to hang around me and Drake. We used to care very deeply about each other. And it said that Caden didn't care about my relationship with Camilla. He was actually going to give her a seat at his table, but she cared deeply about me and that he did not like. So he didn't care about your relationship with Camilla, but then he did care about your relationship with Camilla? I'm confused. So they have to get invited to Camilla's place. They do. She says, I'll tell you where the book is for a price. And the price is a kiss. And for some reason, this is written so that Diana, very who's supposed to be smart, very stupidly thinks, what? I'm not going to kiss Liam. Why would Camilla ask you to kiss Liam? Why would that be the price? What is this? Mortal Instruments? What is this? Cassie Clare? Liam turned away from me, but I caught his expression of what looked like pain, but that couldn't be right. It was probably disgust. I knew he would never agree to kiss me, not even to find the book. Liam kissed goddesses, not monsters. Please stop. Please stop. I can't stand the amount of self-loathing in this book. I don't want to hear it anymore. And Camilla's like, no, I meant that guy kisses me. So world ender, what will it be? I'll give you the book's location and all you have to do is kiss me. And Diana is mad. Seriously? You're considering this? And he's like, it is but a kiss, Diana. What does it matter? What does it matter? You're right. It doesn't matter. And I'm like, is this? Teenagers, are we not 30 year olds? Seriously, I'm sorry. But if a world ending book was on the line, I would probably kiss anybody. If that's what it took, if a simple kiss is what it took, are you serious? I would let Carlos kiss anybody if that's what was on the line. You would never catch me being so out of my mind jealous at a thousand years old worrying about a fucking kiss when the stakes are, it's a book that will destroy the, stop it. There was a way better right way to write this. We did not need the stupid jealousy. Anyway, um, they kiss and he seems to be enjoying it and it says tears threatened to blind me, but I would watch this and I would let it kill what I felt for him. I had been so wrong. Liam did have those feelings. He just didn't have them for me. I guess you had to be a goddess or magic wielding, wielding beautiful witch to get his attention. Maybe Camilla was less of a monster. The self-loathing in this is so heavy handed. We did not need to write it like this. It was well known that Liam hated my kind. I was so angry with myself. I, I felt so foolish. The one person I wanted, I couldn't have. Liam was not mine. And I was not his. We weren't even friends. He's called you his friend like four times up to this point. I was a weapon. It was my own stupid fault for thinking I could be anything other than a tool to him or Caden. Okay, fine. So then um, who shows up? It's Santiago. Uh, Liam is binded. He can't save her. Santiago shows up. They get into a fight. Is that when her heart gets ripped from her chest? I don't know. Diana gets beaten the fuck out of like every fifth chapter. And it turned out that Camilla kissed Liam so that she could transfer a message to him telepathically that she couldn't 
didn't say out loud. Visions ripped through my subconscious as she kissed me. Images of Azrael's daughter, the book she possessed, and the town where she'd stayed filled my mind. Camilla had been working against Caden for some time. In that exchange, she warned me to play along or I would be putting Diana in even more danger. Oh, no, her heart doesn't get pulled from her chest. What happens is these gargoyle monster things, the out, they run out in the forest, get into a fight, and then one of them, like, shows up out of nowhere, sticks its claws through Diana's chest, and then pulls her out, and then into, like, some brush, just disappears with her. Oh, that's right. They're called Irvikuva, and they are there to take her back to Caden. Too late, world ender. You failed again. She returns to the master now in pieces. Wahahaha. I don't think it actually left. And then he turns, uh, and then he pulls out his oblivion blade, which is, like, his special, special blade. The oblivion blade was one that I made during my ascension. The legend of it had been passed down through time. A story told of how I ended worlds and the weapon that made it possible. Even the old gods feared it, and I promised myself I would never summon it again. I thought there was nothing that could force me to break my vow, but the way these creatures had mocked Diana and her pain had proven me wrong. Diana was worth it, and I would risk it all for her. I just don't really believe this. I just feel like, again, this is one of those books where it's like cardboard cutouts of people, and now I make them smooch. I just don't think that this is, like, very good. Okay, they get away from the Irvikunin, and they go, and they meet up with Azrael, as in Book of Azrael's daughter, and her caretaker. Oh, I forgot that at one point during this road trip, they went to a carnival and were taking carnival pictures and eating cotton candy. Forgot about that. Oh, the terms male beauty and masculine scent were used. Ugh, kill me. Oh, and then one, one bit, I forgot, I, I'm going through my notes and I missed a couple of things. It says, I want you to explain, this is me talking to me. I want you to explain to me why it is that we're spending time on multiple paragraphs of Liam talking about how he's jealous of Drake the vampire because Liam is covered in scars on his body and describing in great detail what Drake's muscles look like. Why do I need to know any of this? And obviously this bisexual king is not just jealous. He is also kind of attracted to Drake, Drake and I wish that all of them would just fucking get it over with. All right. Yikes. <laughs> okay. They go to some Celestial's house and they end up, oh my God, I forgot about this. They end up fooling around in the Celestial's house. The Celestial knew that Sam Kyle still existed. So again, we're just establishing the Celestials and the Igmorthans are somehow not communicating despite being, I just, I don't get it. So they're staying at some Celestial's house and they decide to fool around at the Celestial's house, this old couple who, by the way, is Peter's parents and she's the reason that Peter is now dead. Peter from the beginning. Peter, who didn't need to exist at all. Completely irrelevant to the story. So now they are in Peter's parents' house about to fool around in the home of the parents of a dude who she is partly responsible for the death of because he ended up dying <laughs> after he was used as a puppet by her comrade. So they end up fooling around and it turns out that Liam slash Sam Kyle has that same ability as like Dorian from Throne of Glass where he can use like a magic hand as basically a vibrator. So, okay. <laughs> My note said, did this book just do a sex scene with like magic fingers a la Dorian from Throne of Glass? And then at the end, she's like, well, you didn't finish. And he's like, just go to sleep, which is exactly what happens with Rhysand and Farah. And I'm like, this just feels like, this just feels like a bunch of Sarah J. Mass sex scenes, just sort of like, like we just scrapbooked our way to a sex scene using Sarah J. Mass books. And they had used some like euphemism in that scene. And then the next morning she wakes him up with head, which like good for her. And it says, uh, using whatever euphemism, I don't even remember what it was. She said, I love that we're developing our own private jokes, deepening the intimacy between us. And I'm like, ma'am, I got that through context clues. You didn't actually need to explain that to me. Them using a joke during sex, like, I know how that works. I, I get how that deepens intimacy. You don't actually need to tell me that. I got it. I'm not stupid. I mean, okay, so they go see Azriel's daughter, Ava, and they're like, we're just gonna pretend that Diana is Liam's second in command. And yet Ava immediately recognizes Diana's power as one of the iguanas. And I'm confused about how they didn't assume she would know that immediately. Doesn't everybody have the ability to sense power? And it also is an incredibly heavy-handed scene because immediately when Ava comes on the page, Dan is like, there is something very familiar about her. And I'm like, okay, you couldn't be, you are about as subtle as a gun right now. Stop. So then they get to this place, this place, sort of like maze church thing. It should have been like an underground. It, it's It's got a crypt and stuff. Um, this should have, it sh this should have been like national treasure. Like that's what we should have been doing the whole time. Instead, this was like weird road trip. So they get there and before they walk into this crypt place where the book of Azrael is supposed to be that Ava says her dad and her mom stashed it here and her mom's apparently buried there. It says that Diana felt or smelled death. Okay. So it's like doing incredibly 
heavy-handed shit. And so they get inside this crypt, they get the Book of Azrael, and oh god, I'm shocked, another person is betraying them because literally every single person in this book betrays Diana. Every single one. And the reason that she sensed death is because Ava and her uh, caretaker, her bodyguard Geraldo, are both dead. And I think after spending a thousand years with Tobias, the other iguana guy, she should know by now when he is around uh, manipulating dead bodies. But somehow it just, it just went right over her head. And up to this point, um, Liam has been having dreams about Caden and, and, and his father and, and all this stuff saying, this is how the world ends. They go see an oracle who says, this is how the world ends. So then Tobias shows up because Ava and Geraldo, her bodyguard, were dead the whole time. They get into a fight. I don't know why they didn't just teleport with the book the fuck out of there. Um, Diana allows, find, this is the part where her heart gets ripped out of her chest. Diana allows her heart to get ripped out of her chest by Tobias. But before that happens, he says, you asked me who I am, Sam Kyle. And, and Liam slash Sam Kyle realizes that he sort of recognizes Tobias. And he is the guy whose name is actually Hald Noonan. It's not possible. You perished alongside my grandfather. I saw the text. I read them. I know them. Is that what your father told you? Your family is full of liars, Sam Kyle. Too bad you won't be around to figure that out. And I feel like that last line, I know this is kind of a small thing, but I feel like that last line could have been written to make more of an impact. Something like, it's a shame you had to learn that right before you die. Maybe you can ask them about all their lies in the afterlife. Something like that. So then he, because they are in a crypt, uh, Tobias uses necromancy to make crypt creatures to fight against them, which, ah, yes my shit. I wish the whole book was like that. Could we have made Tobias the main character? The main villain even? Damn. What could have been? Diana's like, how the fuck do you know that guy? By the way, he brings Diana back to life um, because her heart got ripped out of her chest. He's not supposed to bring her back to life. That's not, again, his dad said that's a no-no, but he did it because he loves Diana. And so he says to her about Hald Noonan, those things on his head are not uh, horns. They are a crown. He's one of the four kings, which makes you, uh, that makes you a queen of Yezhedin. If he is one of the four, that's why he's so vicious, so territorial, Caden will do anything to get you back. All of this is a moot point. It doesn't get fleshed out in this book because we're towards the end now. So again, the Death King, Tobias, Hald Noonan rips Diana's heart out of her chest, although Diana kind of let him. Liam has to feed her his blood to bring her back to life. Tobias fucks off with the book back to Caden. And then her and Liam slash Sam Kyle fight because he's like, you just throw your lives away, life away on a moment's notice because you think you're a monster and you don't trust me. Anyway, they work it out. Who fucking cares? I certainly don't. So they were tricked into getting the book and, so that Caden could snatch it. Surprise, surprise. Then she sees in a blood dream that he did in fact end his world. And then she wakes up and she's like, you ended your world. And I'm like, bitch, didn't you know that this whole time? Why do you think he's called the world ender? And then he has to explain exactly what happened. And I'm like, this didn't come up sooner? How? I thought you already knew. So Caden has the book now. And also Caden kidnapped her sister. Shocking, shocking. She goes to Caden's and obviously Caden and Gabby are not going to be there. They turn on the TV and the news is reporting and the news reporters are being puppeted by Tobias slash Hal Noonan, the necromancy death king guy. And they're saying the apocalypse is coming, which is actually, this scene was kind of funny watching the reporters like report on the apocalypse as if it's the weather. And they're saying, oh, we have guests. And it's Caden sitting on a throne of bones, which, oh God, here comes the biggest mustache twirly scene I've ever seen in my life, licking blood off his fingers. And Caden explains that supernatural beings exist. So now the mortal beings know and I'm like how did they not know they know about the celestials but they're not they don't know about the vampires what why how you're gonna need to explain things very quickly and then it says that Caden is talking about Sam Kyle's father Onan is that his name I don't remember it's supposed to sound like Odin I'm realizing that now and it says he spoke of my father and my world as if he knew them personally but I didn't recognize him or his name and I'm like wait so you recognized how how Noonan necromancy guy but you don't recognize Caden what a wasted opportunity opportunity. We could have had this reveal that like he was like the old best friend who who Caden or Caden is actually secretly like his father or his old best friend who Liam thought he had accidentally killed or it's even Azrael himself. Instead it's just I don't recognize him. Okay? And Caden's like I'm gonna use this book to bring on the apocalypse. And so they had seen like some sort of oracle Liam and Diana who had told them you will hear a crack and then something something this is how the world ends. Caden slut shames Diana for sleeping with Liam and he's like she'll turn on you too Sam Kyle. Then it's revealed that her friend
friends Drake and Ethan the vampires betrayed her? Of course they did. Everybody betrays Diana. The book might as well be called that. And then Caden snaps Gabby's neck uh, and that's the crack and then because Gabby died the blood deal between Diana and Liam ends and it says this is how the world ends except it's not the world it's my world it's Diana. And Diana gets very angry and rages and then the book ends. So I guess it's supposed to be that Diana is going to end the world because she's so upset about her sister, but I'm still not understanding the tagline. World Ender meets Ender of Worlds. I still don't understand. I read the whole book. That's it. That's how it ends. So um, this was a long road to nowhere. This was a wild goose chase. Uh, we even went to a carnival, carnival. We saw spider people. We went to a maze crypt labyrinth thing. We went all kinds of places. We did all kinds of things and it felt like at the same time we did nothing. We did a whole lot to get to nothing. So I think that again what I would have done with this book is I would have made it so that she made a deal with a devil essentially, right? Not a real devil. A fallen god. She doesn't realize it's a fallen god. She made a deal with him to save her sister's life. Uh, she, she becomes a monster for him and then she wants to get out of this deal so she tries to make a deal with an even higher god who that you know Caden is afraid of so she weaponizes this idea of the book of Azrael against Caden brings down Sam Kael makes a blood pact with him um, and then agrees to go find the book with him in exchange for the safety of her sister and then they head down into like let's call it hell um, into like this labyrinth of hell where they uh, have to solve the riddles three and get the book before Caden and the Igmorathans do like that would have been better <laughs> that feels more fluid. Um, it doesn't feel like we're going all over the fucking place and I'm not really understanding what the fuck we're doing or where we even are. We're not spending so much time with the sister. I don't even think killing the sister was really necessary in the end um, and it just felt like very lazy to be like let's spend a lot of time with Gabby playing with our hair and watching sappy movies together just to get to like the part where it's like she snapped Gabby's neck. I am heartbroken and now I will destroy everything because I have nothing to live for. It felt very shallow. Like we knew it was going to go there because that's all that we had been set up for. It felt incredibly shallow. Now I get that if you're just looking to experience something and you know have a little bit of a laugh and you know it's something that's a little bit fantasy and a little bit sexy you might enjoy this but I am very into plot and world building that is executed in a way that is almost seamless and this is not that. So if that's not going to bother you you might have a good time. Um, if you liked Crescent City you'll probably really like this. I know Crescent City has a lot of fans. I'm simply not one of them but this will probably work for Crescent City's fans. Now Sarah J Maas can string a sentence together better than this book did. Um, Sarah J Maas <laughs> overwrites like this book did but like the ex explanations make more sense and if you don't mind that female scent, male scent, you know male this, male that, female this, female that, feminine masculine constant binary with that um, that's present in here and I know that people don't mind that in Crescent City so I, I, that's here and, and you won't mind it so. If you like Crescent City City, you should try this and no shade to anybody who likes Crescent City. It's just really not my cup of tea. Um, <laughs> uh, this this has a lot of the issues that I really do not like but um, I also don't like, I don't know, um, I don't like deep dish pizza and some people love it. So if you love deep dish pizza, good on you. This is your deep dish pizza. Try this deep dish, deep dish pizza. Jesus Christ, I can't even say deep dish pizza today. Like today Carlos went to go pick us up lunch and he went to Qdoba and I was like, I don't like Qdoba so I'm good. And then he brought me home Chinese, which was really nice of him. So all this to say, if you like Crescent City, you should read this. If you don't have an issue with the same things I take issue with, you should read this. But if your tastes align with mine, I would deeply encourage you to find a different book because this is not going to be, this was not my cup of tea. I will say though that the necromancy, damn, I'm such a sucker for that shit. That was really fun. I had a lot of fun with that. I, anytime Tobias was on the page, I was like, yes more. Kind of wish that was the main character. Anyways, that's it. That was the book of Azrael. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. God damn, this video is probably so long. I'm sure you have questions. So do I. I don't know that I can answer them for you because the world building in this is, but mm, you know. All right. Thanks for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below and uh, I will see you next time. Bye. Oh, and as my patron Peggy said, I love the merda out of you. Okay. Hi, before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons, and I'm losing my voice, sorry. Uh, and those are Alexander, Brittany Bobitney, Cammie, Chris, 
Christine and Bean, DJ Rocktopus, Ellie, Emperor's New Blues, Aaron with two E's, Eric, JC, Jack, Jesse, Jill, John E, Julie D, Kille No K, Casey McKenzie, Kate W, Caitlin M, Quinn, Lady Kittybug, Lemon Jelly, Leck, Night Owl Reader, Alice, Rachel C, Rain, Reese, SJ, Samar, Shadow Auntie, Shiny, SMK, Steph, Chai Guy, and The Salem T. Lynn. Thank you all so much for being here and being a friend. I appreciate you. And last but not least, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Search Marks patrons. And those are Abby, Alicia, Amanda, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley H, Ava, Ballads and Bookends, Beck, Blake, Lemon, Pan, Blythe, Bookish Bats, Bookish Brain Rot, Brie, Caitlin, Cardinal Ginger, Carlin, Casper, Catherine, Kathy, Chris, CJ, Clementine, Cole C, Colleen, Corwin, Corey, Darren, Deborah, Dex, Diet Goth, Dorian, Dorotea, Ebby, Ember, Emerald Dodge, Emily A, Emily L, Emma, Aaron, Ezra Moon, Fiona, Hannah C, Harpy Kuro, Haley, Ilyanaka, India Inc., JM Tennant, Jay is on Olympus, JT, Jelly V, Jen Michelle, Gender Queer, Jenny G, Jessa Sue, Jillian, Jojo Bookish, Just Pugsley, Kai, Cat H, Catherine M, Katie, Kayala, Kendra, Kiara, Kyla, Kylie, Laughing Cat Dog, Laura, Lazarus Ray, Library of Scars, Lisa B, LP, Lou Siri, Lustful Octopus, Martin, MB Marlowe, Madison, Marcella, Marquita, Malara, MK Books, Molly, James, Nat, Natalie M, Never, Nicole G, Nicole R, Nyan Binary, Paige P, Penny Chilling, Fox Club, Rachel B, Reba, Rebecca, Rivy, Rosie, Rowan, Sicoria, Sadie, Samantha M, Sarah C, Sarah H, Sarah the Bear, Sarah Z, Shamed, Shannon, Sheen Onion, Sean, T, Delegati, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tina, Toast, Trash Can Teddy, Taito Phoenix, and Writer A. Thank you all so much for being a friend. Ooh.